The Socialism of Antiquity in classical Greece we encounter the concept of kiliastic socialism in its full-fledged, one might even say ideal, form. Plato's enunciation of this concept in itself had an enormous influence on the subsequent history of kiliastic socialism. Two of Plato's dialogues are devoted to this theme, the Republic and Laws. In the former, Plato depicts what he considers an ideal state structure, while the latter shows the best practical approximation of this ideal. The Republic was written during the middle years of Plato's life, laws in his old age. It seems possible that the failures Plato experienced trying to put his views into practice are reflected in these works. We begin with an overview of the picture of the ideal society that is given in the Republic, a work that Sergius Bulgakov calls wondrous and perplexing. Indeed, the ten books of this dialogue reflect almost all aspects of Plato's philosophy his conception of being, the world of ideas, cognition, the visual world, the world accessible to the mind, the soul, justice, art, and society. The Republic may at first sight seem too narrow a title for such a work. Nevertheless, it is fully justified, since the question of the structure of society is the center around which Plato's many-sided philosophy revolves, as well as serving as the principal illustration of his teaching. Understanding the concepts of good and beauty is essential for ruling a state. The doctrines of the immortality of the soul and of retribution after death promote the development of the spiritual qualities essential for rulers, the state must be founded on justice, and art is one of the major instruments for the education of citizens. Plato expounds on the possible forms of a state, he names five structures, and speaks about the corresponding spiritual qualities. All the states that existed contemporary to him he classifies as belonging to four corrupt types. Division, hostility, discord, willfulness, and striving for riches reign in these states. Quote, Such a city should of necessity be not one, but two, a city of the rich and a city of the poor, dwelling together, and always plotting against one another. End quote. The fifth form of state structure is, according to Plato, the perfect state. Its basic quality is justice, which permits it to partake of virtue. In answer to the question what constitutes justice in a state, Plato says, quote, What we laid down in the beginning as a universal requirement when we were founding our city, this I think, or some form of this, is justice. And what we did lay down, and often said, if you recall, was that each one man must perform one social service in the state for which his nature was best adapted. End quote. On the basis of this proposition, the population of the state is divided into three social groups, we may even call them castes. They are, philosophers, guardians, or soldiers, artisans and peasants. The children of artisans and peasants belong to the same group as their parents and may never become guardians. The children of guardians as a rule inherit their father's occupation, but if they show negative inclinations they are made into either artisans or peasants. But the philosophers may supplement their numbers from the best of the guardians, but not until the latter reach the age of 50. Plato's conception is not at all materialistic, his concern is not with the manner in which production is organized in his state. Thus he speaks very little about the daily life of the artisans and peasants. He believes that the life of the state is determined by its laws, hence he is concerned above all with the life of those castes that create and guard the law. The philosophers have unlimited power in the state. Bulgakov even suggests that the word philosophers should be translated the righteous men or saints. They are the people, quote, enamored of the kind of knowledge which reveals to them something of that essence which is eternal, and is not wandering between the two poles of generation and decay. End quote. A philosopher possesses quote, a mind habituated to thoughts of grandeur and the contemplation of all time and all existence. Such a man will not suppose death to be terrible. End quote. Once the philosophers have understood their high mission, they will structure their lives in accordance with it, quote, devoting the greater part of their time to the study of philosophy, but when the turn comes for each, toiling in the service of the state and holding office for the city's sake, regarding the task not as a fine thing but a necessity. And so, 
when each generation has educated others like themselves to take their place as guardians of the state, they shall depart to the islands of the blessed and there dwell. End quote. The guardians are under the philosopher's command. Plato's favorite image in describing the guardians is that of the dog. Thus, as with purebred canines, the guardians quote, natural disposition is to be most gentle to their familiars and those whom they recognize, but the contrary to those whom they do not know. End quote. Their children should be taken on campaigns in order to accustom them to war, quote, give them a taste of blood as we do with whelps. End quote. Youthful guardians possess the qualities of purebred pups, quote, each of them must be keen of perception, quick in pursuit of what it has apprehended, and strong too if it has to fight it out with its captive. End quote. Women are to enjoy equal rights with men and are to have the same obligations, allowing only for the fact that they have less physical strength than men. Plato argues by analogy, quote, do we expect the females of watchdogs to join in guarding what the males guard and to hunt with them and share all their pursuits, or do we expect the females to stay indoors? End quote. The whole of the guardian caste is compared with a pack of hard and wiry hounds. But a guardian should also possess other, higher qualities, quote, and does it seem to you that our guardian-to-be will also need, in addition to being high-spirited, the further quality of having the love of wisdom in his nature. End quote, and, quote, never by sorcery nor by force can be brought to expel from their souls, this conviction that they must do what is best for the state. End quote. These qualities are attained by means of a carefully thought-out system of education guided by the philosophers and lasting until age 35. A fundamental role in education is reserved for art, which, for the benefit of the state, is subjected to strict censorship. Quote, we must begin, then, it seems, by a censorship over our story makers, and what they do well we must pass and what not, reject. End quote. What they do well applies here not to the aesthetic qualities of stories and myths but to their educational function, bad stories are those quote, that Hesiod and Homer and the other poets relate to us, end quote. Furthermore, quote, shall we, then, thus lightly suffer our children to listen to any chance stories fashioned by any chance teachers and so to take into their minds opinions for the most part contrary to those that we shall think it desirable for them to hold when they are grown up. End quote. All stories that might inspire a false impression of divinity are forbidden, as well as those that describe the cruelty of the gods, their quarrels or love adventures, and stories which suggest that gods may be the cause of misfortune. Quote, we must contend in every way that neither should anyone assert this in his own city if it is to be well governed, nor anyone hear it, neither younger nor older, neither telling a story in meter or without meter. End quote. All poetic works that speak about the horrors of the nether world and of death are to be eliminated, as well as those that involve any manifestation of fear or sorrow all that hinders the development of courage. Guardians should see nothing frightening about death. It is forbidden to speak about the injustice of fate that righteous people can suffer misfortune and unrighteous ones can lead happy lives. It is forbidden to criticize the leaders or to write about any manifestation of fear, grief, famine, or death. Quote, we will beg Homer and the other poets not to be angry if we cancel those and all similar passages, not that they are not poetic and pleasing to most hearers, but because the more poetic they are, the less are they suited to the ear's end. Quote, other arts are also to be kept under surveillance. Quote, it is here, then, I said, in music, as it seems, that our guardians must build their guardhouse and post a watch. End quote. Polyphony and the combining of various scales are forbidden. There are to be no flutes or makers of flutes in the state, only the lyre and the kithara are permitted. Plato expands on these principles, quote, Is it, then, only the poets that we must supervise and compel to embody in their poems the semblance of the good character or else not write poetry among us, or must we keep watch over the other craftsmen, and forbid them to represent the evil disposition, the licentious, the illiberal, the graceless, 
either in the likeness of living creatures or in buildings or in any other product of their art, on penalty, if unable to obey, of being forbidden to practice their art among us? End quote. The answer is obvious for Plato. On the other hand, new myths are created, with the purpose of instilling in the guardians a spirit necessary to the state, for instance, to inculcate in them love for one another and the state, they are told that they are all brothers, sons of the single mother earth of their land. But to reinforce the idea of castes, it is stressed that in the process philosophers received an admixture of gold, guardians of silver, peasants, and artisans of iron. The entire education of the guardians, beginning with children's games, is supervised by the philosophers, who subject them to various tests, checking their memory, endurance, moderation, and courage. Adults, as well as children, are severely punished for lying. But lying is permitted the philosophers. Quote, it seems likely that our rulers will have to make considerable use of falsehood and deception for the benefit of their subjects. End quote. It has already been noted that Plato perceives the major defect of faulty states in the absence of unity among citizens, in animosity and discord. He seeks to find the cause of these phenomena. Quote, and the chief cause of this is when the citizens do not utter in unison such words as mine and not mine, and similarly with regard to the word alien? Precisely so. That city, then, is best ordered in which the greatest number use the expression mine and not mine of the same things in the same way. End quote. The guardian's life is regulated accordingly. They possess quote, nothing in private possession but their bodies, but all else in common. End quote. Quote, secondly, none must have any habitation or treasure house which is not open for all to enter at will. Their food, in such quantities as are needful for athletes of war sober and brave, they must receive as an agreed stipend from the other citizens as the wages of their guardianship, so measured that there shall be neither superfluity at the end of the year nor any lack, and resorting to a common mess like soldiers on campaign they will live together. End quote. Quote, for these only of all the dwellers in the city it is not lawful to handle gold and silver and to touch them nor yet to come under the same roof with them, nor to hang them as ornaments on their limbs nor to drink from silver and gold, end quote. Guardians live in their own state as hired guard detachments. Quote, and what is more, they serve for board wages and do not even receive pay in addition to their food as others do, so that they will not even be able to take a journey on their own account, if they wish to, or make presents to their mistresses, or spend money in other directions according to their desires like the men who are thought to be happy. End quote. Property, however, is only one of the things by which private interests may distract the guardians from their duty. Another factor that could set them apart is the family, therefore it is also eliminated. Quote, these women shall all be common to all these men, and that none shall cohabit with any privately, and that the children shall be common, and that no parent shall know its own offspring nor any child its parent. End quote. Marriage is replaced by a temporary union of sexes for purely physiological satisfaction and propagation of the species. This aspect of life is carefully regulated by the philosophers, which permits the introduction of a perfect system of sex selection. The union of couples is conducted solemnly and is performed to the accompaniment of songs composed by poets especially for these occasions. Who is to be joined to whom is decided by lot so that no one can blame anyone but fate. But the leaders of the state carefully manipulate the process to achieve the desired results. As could be expected, the education of children is in the hands of the state. Quote, the children, will be taken over by the officials appointed for this. But, the offspring of the inferior, and any of those of the other sort who are born defective, they will properly dispose of in secret, so that no one will know what has become of them. End quote. As for a child born of unregulated sexual union, the following is indicated, quote, to dispose of it on the understanding that we cannot rear such an offspring. End quote. Parents ought not know their children, quote, conducting the mothers to the pen when their breasts are full, 
but employing every device to prevent anyone from recognizing her own infant. End quote. As to the question how parents and children shall recognize one another, the answer is as follows, quote, they won't, except that a man will call all male offspring born between the seventh and the tenth month after he became a bridegroom his sons, and all female, daughters, and they will call him father. End quote. Deprived of family, children, and all property, the guardians live exclusively for the benefit of the state. Any violation of the interests of the state is punished. Soldiers who show cowardice are turned into artisans or peasants, prisoners taken are not to be ransomed out of slavery. Medicine is also used as a means of control. Physicians and judges quote, will care for the bodies and souls of such of your citizens as are truly well-born, but those who are not, such as are defective in body, they will suffer to die, and those who are evil-natured and incurable in soul they will themselves put to death. End quote. Why would the guardians undertake such a life? One of the participants in the dialogue says, quote, What will be your defense, Socrates, if anyone objects that you are not making these men very happy, and that through their own fault? For the city really belongs to them and yet they get no enjoyment out of it as ordinary men do. End quote. However, from Plato's point of view happiness is not determined by material well-being. 2. Discharging their duties, the guardians will achieve the respect and love of other citizens, as well as the hope for reward after death. He says, quote, They will live a happier life than that men count most happy, the life of the victors at Olympia. How so? The things for which those are felicitate are a small part of what is secured for these. Their victory is fairer and their public support more complete. For the prize of victory that they win is the salvation of the entire state, the fillet that binds their brows is the public support of themselves and their children they receive honor from the city while they live and when they die a worthy burial. A fair guerdon, indeed, he said. End quote. Though giving a detailed account of the life of the philosophers and guardians, Plato says almost nothing about the rest of the population the artisans and peasants. Laws for them are determined by the philosophers in accordance with the basic principles expressed in the dialogue, quote, nay, t'would not be fitting, to dictate to good and honorable men. For most of the enactments that are needed about these things they will easily, I presume, discover. End quote. Clearly, the entire population is subjected to the philosophers and the guardians. The guardians set up their camp in the city, quote, a position from which they could best hold down rebellion against the laws from within. End quote. Everyone is bound to his profession. Quote, we were at pains to prevent the cobbler from attempting to be at the same time a farmer, a weaver, or a builder instead of just a cobbler, to the end that we might have the cobbler's business well done, and similarly assigned to each and every one man one occupation, for which he was fit and naturally adapted and at which he was to work all his days. End quote. The life of the artisans and the peasants is regulated on the basis of a greater or lesser degree of leveling, since for them both poverty and riches lead to degradation, and quote, the work that he turns out will be worse, and he will also make inferior workmen of his sons or any others whom he teaches. End quote. But it is not clear to what extent the socialist principles that govern the life of the two other groups extend to artisan and peasant. In conclusion, it is interesting to note that religious problems are given a good deal of space in the dialogue, and are clearly connected with the question of the ideal state. However, this linkage is treated in a quite rationalistic fashion religion does not set the state any goals, but rather plays a protective and educational role. Myths many of which are specially invented, as Plato says, with this purpose in mind, facilitate the development of characteristics useful to the state. Almost everyone who has written on Plato's Republic has remarked on the ambiguous impression produced by this dialogue. Plato's scheme for the destruction of the subtlest and most profound features of human personality and the reduction of human society to the level of an anthill evokes revulsion and at the same time one cannot help being impressed by the almost religious impulse to sacrifice personal interests to a higher goal. 
Plato's entire program is founded on the denial of personality but on the denial of egoism as well. He understood that the future of mankind is not dependent on the victory of this or that contending group in the struggle for material interests, but rather on the changes within people and on the development of new human qualities. It is difficult to deny that Plato's Republic is morally, ethically, and in purely aesthetic terms far superior to other systems of chiliastic socialism. If we can suppose that Aristophanes' Ecclesia Zeusi is a parody of ideas such as Plato's presumably widely discussed in Athens at the time then modern systems like that of Marcuse seem much nearer to the caricature than to the original. Marcuse's turning work into play, his socio-sexual protest, the struggle against the necessity of suppressing one's instincts, are shockingly primitive in comparison with the lofty asceticism described by Plato. In spite of their unique role in the history of socialist ideas, Plato's Republic and his laws are but one of many expressions of ancient chiliastic socialism. Attic comedy abounds with references to ideas of this kind. For example, out of the eleven surviving comedies of Aristophanes, two, Ecclesia Zeusi and Plutus, are devoted to socialist themes. During the Hellenistic epoch there came into being an extensive utopian socialist literature, partially serious, in part meant as entertainment, where the ascetic ideal of the Platonic Republic was replaced by the land of milk and honey and by the happy state of free love. The plots of a number of these works are known to us from the historical library by the 1st century BC writer Diodorus. One of the most vivid descriptions tells of a traveler to a state situated on sunny islands, apparently in the Indian Ocean. This state consists of socialist communes of 400 people each. Labor is obligatory for all members of society, moreover, with quote all serving the others in turn, fishing, engaging in crafts, arts, or public service. End quote. Food is regimented in a similar manner, the menu for each day is regulated by law. Quote, marriage is unknown to them, instead they enjoy communal wives, Children are brought up in common as they belong to the whole of the community and are equally loved by all. Frequently, it so happens that nurses exchange babies they are suckling so that even mothers do not recognize their children. End quote. Due to the excellent climate, the inhabitants of the islands were much taller than ordinary mortals. They lived to the age of 150. All who were incurably ill or suffered from some physical defect were supposed to commit suicide. Those who reached a certain age were also to kill themselves. Socialist ideas in one or another form frequently played a role in the movements and sects that arose around emerging Christianity. Even in the first century AD, the sect of the Nicolaes preached the communality of property and wives. The Christian writer Epiphanes considers the sex founder to be Nicholas one of the seven deacons chosen by the community of the disciples of the Apostles in Jerusalem, as recounted in Acts of the Apostles 6, 5. Irenaeus of Lyons and Clement of Alexandria describe the Gnostic sect of Carpocratians which appeared in Alexandria in the 2nd century AD. The founder of this sect, Carpocrates, taught that faith and love bring salvation and place man above good and evil. These ideas were elaborated by his son Epiphanes, who died at the age of 17, having written a work on justice. According to Clement of Alexandria, he was later worshipped as a god in Samos, where a sanctuary was erected to him. Some quotations from Epiphanes follow. God's justice consists in community and equality. The Creator and Father of all gave everyone equally eyes to see and established laws in accordance with His justice without distinguishing female from male, wise from humble and in general one thing from any other. The private character of laws cuts and gnaws the community established by God's law. Do you not understand the words of the Apostle, through law I knew sin, Romans 7, 7. Mine and thine were spread to the detriment of community by virtue of the law. Thus. God made everything common for man, according to the principles of communality, he joins man and woman. In the same way, he links all living beings, in this he has revealed justice demanding communality in conjunction with equality. But those begotten in this way deny the community that has created them, saying, He who takes a wife, let him possess her. 
but they can possess all in common as the animals do. It is therefore laughable to hear the giver of law saying, do not covet and more laughable still the addition, that which is your neighbor's. For he himself invested us with desires, which moreover must be safeguarded as they are necessary for procreation. But even more laughable is the phrase your neighbor's wife, for in this way that which is common is forcibly turned into private property. The members of the Carpocratians, which extended as far as Rome, followed principles of complete communality, including communality of wives. The appearance of Manichaeism gave rise to a great number of sects that professed doctrines of a socialist character. St. Augustine informs us of the existence of such sects at the end of the 3rd and the beginning of the 4th centuries AD. The movement inspired by Mazdak, which was widespread at the beginning of the 5th century in Persia, was also of Manichean origin. Mazdak taught that contradictions, anger, and violence are all related to women and material things. Therefore, in the words of the Persian historian Mohammed ibn Harun, he made all women accessible and all material wealth common and prescribed that everyone had an equal share, just as each has an equal share of water, fire, and pastures. This movement spread over the entire country, and for a time even King Kawad I supported it. Another historian, Taberi, writes, quote, Frequently, a man did not know his son nor the son his own father, and no one possessed enough to be guaranteed life and livelihood. End quote. In the disturbance which subsequently arose, the followers of Mazdak were defeated. The extent of social dislocation caused by this movement can be appreciated from the information that Kawada's heir issued a law ensuring the welfare of fatherless children and legislating the return of abducted women to their families. We encounter here the phenomenon of broad masses of people affected by a socialist doctrine. This was unknown in antiquity, although it is typical of the Middle Ages, to which Mazdak's movement brings us chronologically.